All right, so I think we'll just um, we'll just go ahead and begin, and uh, and people will still uh, be able to come in after we've uh, we've started, and they'll figure things out. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in uh, in the world. Thank you for uh, attending this JMRN uh, book launch. We've got uh, Robert Phillips here with us. Uh, Robert is a uh, assistant professor of anthropology at Ball State University, and he's written a book that's called. Uh, uh, virtual activism. So maybe to get us um, get us started, Rob, you could kind of give us your uh, your elevator pitch. Tell tell us what the book is about. Thank you, um, thank you, Adi, for for planning this. First of all, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, this is my first book launch, and it's the first book launch for this book. So so thank you very much. It, it was very thoughtful of you to to plan this event. Um, yeah, the, the book really is a, an anthropological look at uh, the LGBT rights movement in Singapore. And, you know, it was written, it was written for a bunch of different reasons. Um, of course, it, it is, it is uh, drawn from my dissertation research, uh, which took place in Singapore uh, between 2002, 2007, uh, 2008, approximately. Um, and it's really, like I said, it's, it's a look at this, at this movement that is taking place um, under two or within two very different uh, frameworks. And the first one, of course, is um, this idea of illiberal pragmatics, right? Um, which I think we will hopefully talk about a little bit more in depth. And, and, and quite, you know, quite simply, this idea of illiberal pragmatics um, is, is that it focuses on the idea that on the one hand, uh, the Singaporean government um, criminalizes and um, criticizes um, LGBT uh, subjectivity, and at the same time, um, it's tolerated, right? And, and again, I, I, can, I can talk later if you'd like about sort of how the project came to fruition um, in terms of the, 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 the things that that really struck me about, about Singapore in the early days. Um, the, other, the other sort of big framework I think here is, um, you know, this idea of neoliberal homonormativity. Um, and, and again, a, a very interesting framework, I think, uh, one that is very fitting uh, for Singapore, um, but is also, I think, in a lot of ways, um, very problematic. Um, and again, we can, we can discuss that later if you'd like. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, and, and then of course, in the title, the idea of virtual, um, I look at the virtual in two different ways. Um, this idea of not quite, right? And then I also look at it in terms of um, the idea of possibilities. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically, right. uh, I, basically I the mention, I, I should mention what, what, I, what I didn't mention at the start, which is that Rob and I are gonna, gonna chat relatively informally about the book for about 30 minutes or about uh, 25 more minutes, and then we'll open up for, for Q&A, and there are two ways that, that you can ask a question. If you see um, in your bottom panel, there is a uh, tab that, that says Q&A. If you press that, you can type in your questions. The other way to do it would be to use the chat function and write to, um, to select all panelists and write uh, to say that you have a question, and what we, what we will do then is that we will um, unmute you so that you can ask your question orally. So there are two ways you could do it by using the Q and A function or using the chat function to then uh, ask to be unmuted and then you can ask your question orally um, and Rob will respond um, um, thereafter. All right, so um, I think before we go any further, um, I, I'm always interested and I think a lot of people are interested to, to know um, what kind of trajectory lead someone to study a particular uh, topic. In, in your book, at one moment, you write that when you talk to Singaporean academics, one question that always comes up is, what's so interesting about Singapore? So as a Singaporean academic, I have to ask you that question one more time. Okay, well, thank you. Um, great question. So just, you know, again, I hope I don't go into too much detail here, but you know, when I, my master's degree uh, is in religious studies. And I was, I was doing research in, in South India, looking at women's religious festivals. And I was there from about 80, or I'm sorry, about 98 until, I don't know, 0, 02, 03. And 
in the beginning years of my PhD program, I wanted to continue that work. But the idea here is that when I was flying from Los Angeles to India every year, I would stop in Singapore. And at the time, Singapore Airlines had a program called the Singapore Stopover. And it allowed you to get off the plane for a couple of days, get some good hotel discounts, things like that. And I would stop in Singapore on the way to India. And then I began stopping in Singapore on the way back. And on one particular flight, the very beginning of this whole, whole process, somebody on the flight sitting next to me as we were flying into Singapore said to me, um, have you checked out the gay bars in Singapore? And I, and I said to, I said to her, like, what, what do you mean gay bars? I said, you know, I thought, I thought it's illegal to be gay in Singapore. And of course I know that's not quite right. Um, but I said, I thought it's illegal. And she said, oh no, 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 there's dozens of gay bars in Singapore. There's gay, there's gay nightclubs, there's gay saunas. And I thought, you know, and again, as an anthropologist, isn't this interesting, right? That here, and, and again, once I, once I got to Singapore and began going to bars and such, I realized that at that time, Singapore had more, um, more gay bars, more saunas, um, more gay businesses, I think, than Los Angeles did. And to me, that was, again, as an anthropologist, a very interesting contradiction, right? What's going on here? Where, you know, on the one hand, gay subjectivity, at the very least, is criminalized, or the actions that go along with, with gay subjectivity are criminalized. But at the same time, the government is, is allowing these, these LGBT spaces to operate. And I, think, and I think the thing that really kind of pushed me over the edge in terms of deciding to focus on Singapore rather than continuing in India was, was, the, was the nation party um, or the nation parties. Because I thought, okay, now we have, it's not just bars that are, are happening here uh, and, and saunas, but you know, parties that the government is actually advertising. Um, so that, that is really the trajectory, right? And again, I had, I had some choices to make and I, I think ultimately it would have been easier to continue with the work in India. But I think a great, I made a great decision by switching to Singapore um, because I think it, you know, it's, it's opened my mind up to, uh, you know, the varieties of LGBT experience in the world. And, and again, this idea of, of contradiction, right? Or, you know, the, and again, I think that, that illiberal pragmatics is one, one giant contradiction. So that, I mean, that's sort of the gist of it, right? And, it, and the, more, the more time that I, you know, I lived, I lived in Clemente for, I don't know, two and a half years um, in an HDB apartment, not quite legally. Um, but, you know, the, the more time I lived in Singapore, the more I, I tried to understand, you know, the, the culture, um, you know, writ large. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and you really get a sense of that, I think, in, in your book. Everything really um, th that you discuss stems from uh, the, these contradictions, these um, ambivalences. Before we go um, any further, I, I want to ask you about uh, something quite basic but fundamental, uh, terminology. And I suppose as a linguistic anthropologist, you'll have a lot to uh, to, to say about that. So you, you use... Um, you, you tend to use LGBT in, uh, in the book, uh, throughout the book. You explain right. uh, briefly uh, at the beginning uh, why you do so. But what I want to ask is, uh, well, first of all, could, could, you, could you restate why you, you use LGBT over, um, say, queer or over any other, um, you know, um, uh, term? Secondly, um, do you see a difference? Did you, did you observe a difference between your participants in the terms that, uh, that they would use? And did, say, uh, participants, say, say, for example, the same participant, participant did they use uh, a variety of terms in different contexts for different reasons? So I guess I, I want you to talk a little bit about, uh, about terminology and what, um, and what uh, the use of these uh, terminologies can can tell us about um, the uh, uh, LGBT or queer or uh, so on and so forth experience in in Singapore. 
Yeah, thank you. Great question. Yeah, and I, and I think for me, what for me, what's interesting here is, um, and this this goes back again. I, I hope I'm not giving too much background here, but this goes back to um, sort of like the, the mid 2000s when I was when I was an active member of AQA, or actually before that, it was Solga, the Society of Lesbian and Gay Anthropologists, and or the Society for Lesbian and Gay Anthropology. And we were trying to come up with a new name for the organization. And we went through, I mean, it was, it was hundreds of emails probably back and forth between the group about how to rename the group. And we eventually came up with the Association for Queer Anthropology. Um, but what that made me think about, that entire process of renaming this organization was there is this sort of endless number of initialisms that we can deploy when talking about LGBT. And, and it can sort of go on forever. The other thing that I think is important here is, again, I think I quote um, Phelan in, 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 the, in the beginning of the book where, I talk, where he talks about um, unstable identity processes. And, and I think that speaks to this as well, right? This idea that LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTQ+, plus, um, queer, um, aqua, you know, these, all these different terms that were, you know, that we pond on, these terms that were sort of thrown around. And, and for me, and I, I think I say this in the beginning, for me, it's simplicity. But I think more importantly than that, it is this idea that the people that I was interviewing, the people that I was interacting with, were using LGBT for the most part, right? And I think, and I think the people that, the, you know, the, the people that use terms like queer, were people or Singaporeans who had been educated in the UK, the US and Australia. And so for me, I wanted to sort of, use, at least, you know, for the period that I was living in Singapore and researching in Singapore, I wanted to, you know, accurately reflect the terminology that was being used by the people that I was studying. Um, not sort of enforcing this Western um, notion of subjectivity on these on, on people right does that make sense yeah that makes sense so so what, what you're saying uh, is that um is, is that you, your respondents for um for, for the most part would use lgbt yes well you you also mentioned that uh that some people did use queer some people did use aqua pondan um did they use them um did they use these terms simultaneously or were different people using different different terms it was it was always it was always contextual right so yeah different different context contextual. Different terms definitely and again it would depend it would depend where i was who i was speaking with who else was in the room you know that kind of thing okay all right so let's let's move on to um to the work itself um, okay. Just to clarify, because you, you were talking about the early 2000s, so what, what period are we looking at here in, uh, in, in, in the book, and what years did you spend on fieldwork in, in Singapore? Okay, good. Yeah, so I was, I, the book really focuses on sort of the mid-90s until about 2018, right? So it's quite a long, it's quite a long period of time, a little, a little over 20 years. Um, I actually lived, I actually you know, I think I spent, you know, the summers of 2003, 2004, 2005 in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And then after I got my funding, my, my real funding, I was able to, um, I think I was there for about 18 months in, in Clemente. Uh, and again, that was, that was in 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. okay. And so again, you know, 13, 13, 14 years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, yeah. been a while. it's been a while. And, and, and again, you know, part of one of the reasons I wanted to write this was that, you know, to sort of to sort of document this history, right, this, this, this historical sort of period in Singapore's history that I think is, is was a pretty significant period. Right. And, and again, as I talk about in the book, because of the introduction of the Internet. Right. Yeah. Particularly broadband, which really allowed 
um, for much more engagement, uh, yeah. both within Singapore, within the region, and, and internationally. Mm -hmm. All right, but you you also do look at at the period right before the internet. So you you know you're starting it um, in in the early nineties. Ninety three, um, ninety four. 94 the, uh, and, and you're charting these, these changes do, uh, in, in, um, in contestation, organizing, activism um, from uh, the 90s to the, uh, you know, say 2008. So in essence, like, what, what you're doing is that you, you've charted um, a prehistory to, to, uh, to a movement that, that I think a lot of people are familiar with now beyond the LGBT community, Pink Dot. So this is essentially a prehistory of, um, of Pink Dot and how how Ping Dot emerges um, as a function of a, of a particular set of, of, um, of circumstances. And right at the beginning, beginning of the book, you, um, you stated very clearly, you say that this book is about, about change, mm -hmm. um, not large changes, but you use the term little earthquakes. Right. So could you tell us a little bit about that? What, what kind of little earthquakes are we seeing in the period between um, say 1993, 1994. So around the time of uh, you know the, the Rascals raid, um, the uh, the Tanjung Ru entrapment, um, to 2008. So right before uh, the very first Ping Dot. So what kind of changes are we seeing, and how is that um, is that facilitated by by the internet? Well, yeah, good question. You know, I think I think the first sort of little earthquake was the Rascals raid, right? And I think that that in that in some ways woke people up to the fact that there was a problem. And, and I think that sort of just gave people a little bit of a nudge to, um, to try to affect change. And, you know, it was what, 93, 94, when the PLE newsletter was published. Again, I think that was one of those little earthquakes as well. Right. Where, so, sorry, Rob. Actually, I just I just realized that that uh, not everyone uh, who's listening, um, not everyone who's listening, may be familiar with uh, this particular history. So, could, could you tell us actually what what went down at, at Rascals? Yeah, Rascals. Nineteen ninety three. Yeah. So, nineteen ninety three, there was a raid at a a bar, uh, and please, Adi, fill in whatever I don't fill in. But there was there was a raid at 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 a at a bar called Rascals. And several people, uh, my understanding is that everybody was sort of taken outside, lined up, made to show ID. Um, some people were arrested, as far as I know. Um, and it, and it, I, think it, I think it caused a lot of people uh, within the community a lot of embarrassment. Um, would you like to add anything to that, Adi? Well, I, I guess the other thing is, is that, um, you know, it's not like, like rates like that do didn't happen before, right? right. So, um, w one question to ask is: um, is why why did that become such a big um, a big moment, so to speak? And and how did so? Uh, one of one of the uh, the the men who was who was uh, who was detained on on that night, mm -hmm. he uh, he filed a complaint and he got an apology and he exactly. got a um, a. He, in in that apology, he was told that uh, that uh, this was this was you know we we had, we had overstepped, and um, this won't happen again. So right. that that was quite. I think I think that particular moment that was quite uh, important because it signaled that um, the boundaries were shifting. That there was slightly more space now. That um, that that you could be. That you could you could advocate for for your for, for yourself and for your community at, at this moment. Um, so so I, I suppose that leads us directly into some of the um, um, community organizing that you chart in in your book, right? So so what comes right after that? Um, I think you suggest that it's it's uh, it's PLU, right? The PLU and and of course the PLU newsletter, and you know thanks thanks to some some hardworking mentors of mine when I was a grad student, I was able to um, get, you know, uh, copies of most of the newsletters uh, from the Cornell Southeast Asian archives and was able to, and I think, and I think, and again, that was one of my favorite, one of my favorite chapters in the book was sort of writing about the, those PLU newsletters because it was really, you know, the time before the internet. And, and it was a time, and again, I love, I love that idea of, 
making do with the technology that's available. And you know, prior to the internet being introduced into Singapore, it was you know, this idea of somebody gives you the newsletter, you read it, you photocopy it, and then you pass it on. And it's, 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 it's very similar, of course, to you know, the kinds of things that we see today on social media, but it's just, it's, it's, the scope and the scale are very different, right? Mm -hmm. Very much, very much smaller. And so again, so I think, you know, Rascals, the, PL, the PLU newsletter, um, you know, the formation of PLU, and, and then of course going online, you know, to the internet and you know, the introduction of Signal in 1999, um, the Singapore Gay News List, which, which again, um, my understanding is it's no longer active, but you know, the archives are still there and it, it, it is a very, and again, I, I, I think it, you know, it's worthy of a dissertation for someone to look at, at the discourse that takes place um, in, the, in, in the signal group. Mm -hmm. um, because it, 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 it really kind of lays out arguments, it lays out histories, um, it, it, it um, encapsulates a lot of, of Singaporean gay news at the time. Um, so, so those are the kinds of little earthquakes that I'm talking about. And I, think, and I think the other kind of little earthquake too, again, from the beginning of the book, um, the, the vignette that I use um, about the morning after, I think, you know, the very act of, of one person coming out um, to their mother or to their parents or their siblings um, is one of those little earthquakes, right? It's, it's this minor little tremor that you might even notice it, but I think, I think once these kinds of things begin to um, occur, it almost becomes a symphony, right? Or a crescendo of these little earthquakes, right? Um, and again, I think it, 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 it created this kind of momentum, right, that I, th that I think is, is still building today um, mm -hmm. with, with Pink Dot, right. Um, and again, little, just all kinds of little incidences, I think, you know, are these little earthquakes I'm talking about that on the surface may seem insignificant, right. Um, you know, the, the, the banning of the, of the In the Pink pic, uh, Picnic, uh, the the, the, the cancellation or the banning of uh, the pink, I think it was called the pink race, you know, the 5K um, around the botanic gardens, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and these little earthquakes, right, these little movements, and I, think, and I think not just within the LGBT community, but also, you know, within the Singaporean general public, um, where people began, I think, to sort of see LGBT Singaporeans not as some foreign other, right? But as one of us, right? Um, mm -hmm. Part, part, part of, part of um, this this city state. Um, well, the, the two really interesting points that um, to to kind of I think to to bring out uh, a, a little bit more. One is that uh, these little earth, earthquakes they're incremental. Uh, and, and they come to form something bigger. But at the same time, each of these little earthquakes are responses to, um, to, to repression, actually. So right. something is, is banned, something is shut down, and uh, people find, find a way. They, they, they make do, they, they channel the energies into something else. So um, when, when a newsletter isn't, um, isn't given uh, uh, a permit, they go online and they form an online newsletter, right? Um, right. Or when, when the nation party is, is canceled, you get something else. And um, it's, sort of, it's sort of always trying to figure out um, where the boundaries are and, and how best to, to push against them. So you're always, you know, as you say, you're, you're always um, making do. But I suppose, um, and this is something that I think uh, Lynette Chua has called uh, pragmatic resistance, right? Yes, yes. Um, so the problem, I suppose, is that if you're in a, uh, a, a context where one of your main options, or maybe even your only option, is pragmatic resistance, at what point does pragmatic resistance um, cease being resistance and becomes compliance? 
Do, do you get what I'm saying? What do you mean? What do you mean by compliance, though? Com so, so. Uh, you know, um, I, I see what you're saying, and so are you thinking here? I'm because right there at the end, you know, when you're talking about about um, about um, being able to portray yourself as part of the nation, part of the city state, you know, you have to be able to fit in to the ideal citizen of the city state. Uh, what happens if if you can't really fit in, um, <laughs> no matter your, what your best efforts are? Then, then right. What well, do you do? well, I, I think I think you're bringing up some interesting points though too, because I think I think sort of what I sort of see you getting at is this idea of, you know, this neoliberal homonormativity, right? This kind of idea of um, the good gay, right? Um, versus, versus sort of the queer, right? And I think, and I think, you know, I think Pink Dot is a really good example of that. You know, that, that idea of you know, and I, I write briefly in here about, about OB markers, right? And, and pushing the OB markers. And I think that, that in many instances, the kinds of resistance we're seeing, um, it's, it's all that can happen within the framework, right? And so I think, I think that it's really easy to look at something like Pink Dot and especially, you know, again, the videos that I write about, I think in chapter five or six, um, you know, as being homonormative, right? You're portraying these sort of ideal types of Singaporean LGBT individuals, right? But, but so, so is it sort of sleeping with the enemy, right, to, to do that? Or is it, is it something else? Because I think, I think this, this idea of resistance, right, within the Singaporean context is, is bounded, right? That there's only so, so hard or so far that you can push without, without having, you know, the, the hard touch of the government uh, come down on you, right? And so I think, I think this, yeah, I think, I think it's just that, I, again, that idea that in order to resist in Singapore, you have to do it in a certain way, mm -hmm. a way that is acceptable, a way that is, you know, and again, I, I don't want to sound too critical here, but I think, you know, the idea of the, the, the little plush um, stuffed toys for Pink Dot and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the little smiley faces and the you know, bringing, bringing mom and dad and grandma to the protest. Well, that's it, it's, it's it's interesting right? that, you, that you use that, um, that word. Rob, are you still there? Yeah. Sorry, I, th I think the, uh, the, the video's just off, uh, lagged a little bit, but uh, what, what did so, you yeah. say right at the end there? Uh, after, after you said bringing, bringing mom and dad to the protest? Oh, well, I just, like I said, I think, I think that you know, many people might look at that as being sort of heteronormative or even a, yeah. a, a kind of homonormativity. And I, yeah, so that, but I think again, within the context of, Sing and again, Singapore's like, like every nation is a, is a unique space. Um, and so within the Singaporean context, that works, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's why, again, not getting too ahead of myself here, but that's why, um, you know, places like Salt, Salt Lake City uh, in Utah, was one of the first American cities to host a pink dot, right? It, a Mormon, a Mormon stronghold, right? So again, you know, lots of similarities between, you know, the, the, the morality of Singapore and the morality of the Mormons, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Well, in, in Singapore as well, you have that, um, I, I, I guess this is what, what you're hinting at, um, that um, in order to be to be heard and not to be immediately shut down, you have to be able to present yourself as uh, as non confrontational and 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 not threatening to uh, to the establishment. Um, okay. So, in, in a word, you have to be you know quote unquote uh, apolitical. Um, so it's interesting that you used you know when describing Pink Dot. I, I'm not sure if that was intentional, but you used the word protest because protest um, until recently wasn't a word that Ping Dot used, right? They used it right. for the first time 
uh, uh, last year. And I guess that, you know, for this, for most of Ping Dot's history, not using protest as a word and instead um, uh, portraying it as a, you know, like a big picnic, basically. Um, right. That's, that's been a way to mobilize and to gain visibility without being, without being repressed. Exactly. Because, you know, for people who, 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 are, who are unfamiliar with Singapore, Singapore, of course, has a very long history of, uh, of state violence and, uh, and repression against um, uh, forms of dissent that, th that threaten the, uh, the, the PAP government. So if, if what you're doing is a protest, you know, it, it might become a little bit uncomfortable. But how, how do you make sense then, Rob, of, um, of the sudden change then in 2019, um, having for the first time uh, a spokesperson of Ping Dot use the word protest um, in Hong Lim Park, when this well, is a word they never used before? Well, I, th I think, again, it's that idea of that incremental change right where and i think and i think a lot of I'm, I'm 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 supposing here that it wasn't intentional but i think one of the things that that pink dot has accomplished over the years is it has exposed singaporeans you know sort of the general public to a group of people that they really haven't been exposed to before in a in a public way and and I think, you know, beginning in, in 2009 with the first pink dot that, you know, it grew, you know, sort of by leaps and bounds every year and, you know, until, until 2017. But, you know, but that idea of, you know, every single year exposing the general public to their LGBT uh, neighbors began to open up people's minds. And I, th and I think it also, in a way, emboldened the organizers of, of, of Pink Dot um, to, again, I think they were pushing, pushing, pushing those, those OB markers, right? The limits of protest, if you will, until they were actually able to talk about it as a protest. Um, and, I think, and I think one of the, you know, one of the things that that, that made a big difference here was, and again, I don't write about it in the book, but um, you know, the, appear, the appearance at Pink Dot of very high government officials. Um, and that was, I believe, in 2019. And so that I think may have given people a little bit more encouragement, right? Mm -hmm. To speak about to you to use the language of protest yeah um no i can't remember i my 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 memory was that it was um it it, it was only well, uh, lee sian long's brother yeah and lee kuan yu's grandson and his his partner w were there other government would that act well, well, they, and again government. maybe i misspoke not yeah. government officials but you know, okay. connected yeah. to the government, right? And, and of course, in, in Singapore, that makes sense, right? Because uh, because of the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew and the uh, the uh, at the very least symbolic tie between the Lee family, uh, the the party, the PAP, and and the government, but actually, you know, well beyond well beyond symbolic as well. Um, and I almost, I almost, I almost, I, I stopped myself. But I almost said, you know, the, the royal family is what. Well, I mean, you know, they, that, that they, is they in well a way be. sort of how I look at at, at the Lees, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think by having a member of the Lee family there, yeah. you know, supporting a grandson of Lee Kuan Yew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you you, you, had, you had the princess there. Yeah, basically, and yeah. and 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 I think and I think you know I'm, I'm writing about this in a new article. Um, about, you know, the, the discourse around Pink Dot in state papers versus um, on the online citizen, um, you know, that the Straits, Time, the Straits Times basically censored that story, right? Um, they did not, they did not want that story, um, as far as I can tell, to, to be circulated, um, if it, you know, if it wasn't necessary. And, and they, yeah, they tried to squash the story. Okay. 
uh, let's go back a little bit and, and um, I, I want to touch on, on, on a couple more points and then I'll open it up for, uh, for discussion. Sure. Um, so what, what is, what allows Ping Dot to, what allowed Ping Dot early on to be successful to avoid, relatively speaking, being, you know, the government's heavy touch, so to speak, uh, is what was, was uh, their language. So um, being rooted in, uh, you know, the, uh, what, what was it, the freedom to love or something like that. Uh, so rooted in discourses of the family and of the nation. And you write about that uh, very clearly. Um, and you link it to something broader. So you, you, in particular, I want to discuss um, if we have if we have the time. Uh, three moments in, in your book. One where you where you talk about Clarence, who is a thirty seven year old Indian Singaporean, okay. and uh, two in the pink, uh, mm -hmm. which you attended at the Botanic Gardens, and okay. three um, Otto Fong's blog post. Sure. Okay, so let's start with uh, with Clarence. So Clarence is a 37 year old Indian Singaporean. He's out to his uh, to his family. No one uh, discusses it though, because um, and he <laughs> sighs as he says this. Um, they still think it's a face, and he's not out to his parents. Uh, sorry, to his partner's uh, family as well, because his partner thinks that they're just uh, just best friends. And you analyze um, this by writing that. Uh, and this is a quote, uh, this tacit subjectivity, which assumes that the family already knows one's sexual orientation, however, is a major component of Tong, tong Zhi. It also resonates strongly with e-liberal pragmatics and neoliberal homonormativity. And my, my apologies, because I, I probably butchered the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese word there. Um, and Clarence goes on to say that uh, as long as they keep keep quiet, so he and his partner, as long as they keep quiet, don't push things, everything is going to be okay. But if you uh, if you uh, make a big deal about it, they're going to take a stand and they're going to be against you. And so for the benefit of family relations, they just keep quiet um, because it's no big deal. And this, this is him uh, speaking. It is no big deal because they accept me as a person. And I think that is of more value to me than them to treat me as a gay person. So um, Rob, you make sense of this by, um, by drawing a distinction between um, the wants and desires of LGBT Singaporeans um, who may not necessarily want their sexual subjectivity to be visible or may not even adhere to the concept of um, of the closet or coming out. Um, but I guess what I want to ask, well, first of all, maybe, maybe elaborate on, uh, on, on Tongji. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. So, so Tongji is a, is a, you know, it's a concept that I really first came across, you know, in the, I guess, late nineties, early two thousands, when I was doing my preliminary research on Singapore. And, and Tongju basically, and again, I mean, I'm, I'm just sort of paraphrasing here, but you know, it's, it, was, it was a term that was co-opted um, from, from the Chinese communist government. Um, Tongju actually means comrade. And, and so um, LGBT organizers in, in Hong Kong um, began using this term um, you know, in, in a um, sort of ironic way, right? Um, to, to talk about themselves and their, and their movement. And, and what, what, the, way that I, the way that I see Tongzhe is that it, it, it looks at your sexual subjectivity not as something that we look at here in the West that can separate you from your family, right? In which, in which we make a big, a big production about sort of coming out, right? Um, Tongzhe is much more about uh, acknowledging your sexual subjectivity within the a cultural context, right? And so, so it's much more important in Tongzhe to not make a big deal about your sexuality, right? It's like, okay, everybody knows you're gay, right? It's fine, 
right? We just don't want to have it, we don't want to talk about it 24 seven, right? Um, and we don't, we don't, there is so much more to you than your sexuality. And we'd like, we'd like to embrace you as a, as a whole person within our community. Does that make sense? And so, so this idea of Tongju really is, it's, it's this sort of idea of the situatedness of our sexuality, that it's not something that should tear people apart, right? It should bring people together. And I think that, again, sort of, you know, it should, it should help you to become a better part of the family, right? And it's not, and it's not, and again, in the West, we, again, the language, right? In the West, it's this declaration, right? People sit their parents down and they say, I am gay, I am trans, I am lesbian, right? And it's, and it's all about me, right? It's all about the individual. But I think, you know, within a communalistic culture such as Singapore, right, which is in many ways not about the individual, that Tongja makes more sense, right? Mm -hmm. And as, again, I, I want to make it clear that as I, I think I point out in the book, that, you know, that even though I thought that people were operating within this framework of Tongja, people didn't really talk about it that much, mm -hmm. right? The people that were talking about it using that word specifically were, you know, foreign educated activists is how I would just, you know, how I would classify them, right? Um, but nonetheless, you know, the actions were still there, right? I mean, the, the ideas were still there. And so this, so again, I think Tongji is really, is really important here because I think that is, is the same framework in which, you know, um, the Pink Dot movement um, is framed, right? This idea that it's, it's about, and again, going back to language, it's about family, it's about friends, it's about mm -hmm. love, right? It's not about, it's not about, you know, it's not about sex, right? It's about love and cuddling and, you know, I, th I think, yeah, I do, I do write about it in the book. I write, you know, I write about, I mention in the book, um, I write a little bit about uh, SQ21, uh, Singapore Queers in the 21st Century. And, and again, I, it, it, was a, it was a wonderful moment in Singaporean history when, you know, I went to the book launches at Kinekinoya. Uh, there was one at, I think there was one at Borders. Um, and, and, and that was a real moment because it sort of gave a face to queer Singaporeans. And, but it also, again, it also approached the lives of these individuals um, through a very sort of Tongjo frame, right? It wasn't about we know that um, that this frame. So, sorry, it, it lagged for a minute. So I thought you were done. But would would you say that um, that uh, this frame is a an example of making do, or or, or is it something that's that, that you think is is um, is more culturally rooted? You know, bear, bearing in mind um, the uh, you know, the invention of, uh, of Asian values all of a sudden in, in, oh. uh, in, in the nineties and maybe Asian right. values 2.0, right, right, right now. when uh, uh, you have these establishment types, um, talking about, you know, wh when, especially when, when, uh, race, religion, ethnicity comes into question, you know, they're saying don't, don't import this and that framework from, uh, from, from the West. So, you know, we, we're kind of back to Asian values right now. So do, do you see, Tongzhe as um, as a uh, as a compromise as a, as a tactic rather, um, or or do you see it as something that's that's a little bit more rooted to to uh, to the culture? Well, I hate to say this, but I think it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I think because I think if it if it is a tactic, I, I'm not sure it's conscious, right? Um, I think, I think people employ that way of talking about sexuality because it works, right? It, it's effective. And I think, and again, I think there are, you know, there are several of the, of the videos, uh, from, I think, uh, 2015, 2016, maybe from Pink Dot. 
And one of those videos is um, two gay men coming home to one of their mothers. Well, I guess they live with their mother, but you know, the two, the two, the two young men coming home um, and the one boy I think says, hi mom. And the other boy says, hi auntie. And she makes them sandwiches or something. And it's this very kind of family oriented, um, loving way of framing a gay sexuality, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think they did it that way because it works, right? That people don't want to think about the messiness or the reality perhaps of LGBT sex, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think young people would rather have their parents not think about that. And so rather than, than sort of being realistic about what it means to be LGBT and to engage in LD, LGBT sexual practices, it's easier and more, more culturally uh, relevant perhaps to frame it within family, love, um, home, right? And all of those family, home, and love are in every one of those videos. Mm -hmm. right? Not talking about, you know, again, like this, this sort of realities of, of what sex is like. Does that make sense to you? I mean, what I'm saying here? Um, yeah, that, that, because, that, that I think, again, I think, because I think it's sort of going back to the idea of, of you know, this homo normativity, you know, I think, you know, I think, I think that, you know, many of the, of the, the gay men uh, here in the West in my generation and, and the generation that right before mine, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of my 20s and early 30s um, taking care of friends dying from HIV AIDS, right? And, and I think that, you know, the LGBT rights we were fighting for are not what we have today, right? Mm -hmm. I think, I think that, that, that that generation of gay men who gave their lives fighting for LGBT rights would be rolling over in their graves if they, know, if they, if they knew what had become of us, right? This, you know, embracing a homonormativity. Um, and again, Singapore's a whole different situation, I think. But I think in the, in the broader in the broader sense, right? It was never it was never about gay marriage, right? It was never about um, buying a house together, moving to the suburbs, buying a Subaru, getting a dog, adopting children. It was never about that, right? It was always about this freedom to love how we want to love, right? Whether we want to have, we, whether we want, you know, one partner or 500 partners, right? Um, and so I think, I think in a lot of ways, this, this, this move towards homonormativity um, is, it's sad, I think. And I, you know, I also think that it's, um, it's completely missed the earlier goals um, of the of the of the LGBT rights movement. Um, you know, there was there was a, a a document that I that I read every so often in my classes, and it's called the Gay Manifesto, and it was published in 1969 by the Red Butterfly um, Collective, um, and it and it it's a beautifully written um, manifesto. Um, that, you know, again, it argues against gay marriage. It argues against homonormativity without using that language. And, and so I think, you know, homonormativity can be very useful in a, in a place like Singapore um, for a while. But I think, I think in the long term, um, it, can be quite, it can be quite destructive. Okay, well, I, that makes a lot of sense. I think um, it's time to go to q and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about 
in the pink and out of Fung's blog post, but uh, we'll, we'll move straight to Q&A um, because I, I, I've realized that, that uh, we have a captive audience and uh, they, they shouldn't be forced to listen to us talk for hours and hours. Um, but if, if um, anyone does want to ask about in the pink, um, which is this uh, picnic that happens that happened in uh, the Botanic Gardens. Very interesting story about it um, in 2007, so two years before the first pink dot. Or about Otto Fong's blog post, which sparked uh, this huge, huge uh, uh, public discussion in uh, in Singapore. Otto Fong uh, uh, is a gay. At the time, he was um, uh, working at uh, at Raffles Institution in uh, in Singapore, and he come out as gay in his uh, in his blog post in a very interesting way. Um, and Rob dedicates, uh, I, th I think, an entire chapter to analyzing his uh, his his blog post and the and the uh, and the consequences, the aftermath. Um, so if you do want to ask about that, uh, feel free. So we've got um, a couple of questions now. Um, we we have, um, so Jason has his hand raised and we've got two Q&A uh, typed in, in um, uh, questions. So just to remind you um, what you can do if you want to ask a question, you can click the Q&A uh, tab in your bottom panel and you can type your question there. Or you can do what Jason has, has done and, uh, and, and, uh, and raise your hand. And then what we'll do is we will unmute you and then you can ask your question orally. Um, or you could use the chat function to write to, uh, to Rob and myself, uh, selecting all panelists and, and, uh, and say you'd like to be unmuted, you know, um, and, and we'll, we'll do that. So we'll go in order of, of the questions that we've already received. So uh, we have a question from uh, Sinyu Guan. He says, uh, uh, thanks for the talk. How do questions of race and ethnicity figure in your discussion on LGBT activism in Singapore? Oh yeah, thank you, Sinyu, for the question. Um, yeah, so how uh, race and ethnicity? Yeah, I don't, you know, in a book, I really, I really focus um, not so much on race and ethnicity. I have a, I have a book chapter uh, in a book uh, called Queer Singapore, I believe. Um, and where I do, I do focus on Indian Singaporeans because I think um, most, and again, you know, with, with, with a majority Chinese uh, population in Singapore, um, most, of, most of what I've written about is about Chinese Singaporeans. Um, but I think, I think it's, it's, it's worth, you know, thinking a little bit more about um, Malay, uh, Singaporeans and Indian Singaporeans, and I see, I see. Is there another question in there? Oh, no, okay. no, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> no. So, so I, I, I think, I think, and again, I, I, I just think it's important to point out that you know this is, you know, this, this was my experience in Singapore, right? I'm not, I'm, I don't want to make any generaliz generalizations. But my experience in Singapore was that what there was a very kind of um, racialized prejudice in the LGBT community against uh, Malay Singaporeans and against Indian Singaporeans in particular, and and so you know I think I think that in in, in some ways that you know it's it's difficult to write about the entire community when the people that are most active in that community from, again, from my experience, were the Chinese Singaporeans. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that answers your question or if there was more. To that. Because I think, and again, I think, I think race and ethnicity is very important here. Um, and again, looking looking at a lot of um, some of the pink dot videos that have been made, um, they they uh, feature mainly Chinese Singaporeans in the videos, and and again, I don't think that's I don't think that's that's anything racial. I think it's much more about um, perhaps Chinese Singaporeans feeling more comfortable for some reason, um, being public about their sexuality or their their gender preferences. Um, I don't know. Adi, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, is there anything that you can... 
Yeah, so I, help, you know, I've, help, me, help me sort of tease out a little bit more of this. I have, I have a lot to say about it, but uh, I'll, I'll limit myself um, to two things. Uh, one, I, I'll mention that, um, that uh, outside of Ping Dot or outside of, of like the uh, Ping Dot organizing uh, group or committee, um, you, you have some groups which, um, which are um, uh, that don't fit this um, uh, Chinese middle class uh, profile, you know, the kind of acceptable Sing Singaporean uh, uh, citizen or the, the, uh, the ideal Singaporean citizen. Um, you, you have a group, I don't know if you know, maybe some people in the audience will, will know called Bisu that was started recently. Um, and Bisu is a, is a is a Buddhist term uh, for a uh, um, for kind of a med, meta agenda. Med, meta agenda. Hmm. Um, so um, in Buddhist societies, uh, someone who is uh, who is uh, Bisu um, is not male or female. Uh, that binary uh, traditionally doesn't doesn't necessarily exist. There there are I think up to seven genders. And um, and Bisu is is uh, an individual who is said to ha to possess all of these genders, being being a kind of meta meta category, and so they have a special role in society, a kind of uh, spiritual spiritual role. Um, so you have a group like that, which which I think started uh, maybe two years ago or, or so, uh, mo uh, of mostly Malay Singaporeans. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Outside of Ping Dot, you have smaller groups that 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 do that have been organizing and that um, that have been, um, I think, working working outside of a more um, uh, Chinese dominated uh, space. And that is a criticism that you do hear, I think, quite often among minorities with uh, with LGBT spaces in in Singapore. Maybe not T, maybe LG, LGB spaces more 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 specifically. Um, Maybe this is a good time to actually uh, very quickly mention um, um, Otto Fong's blog post because um, one of the things that you know, maybe this wasn't the this is not the, the most important point of his blog post and and, and uh, Otto Fong is someone that I admire uh, a great deal and respect a great deal but um, in the post it's very interesting one thing that he did say was um, that. Um, he was not demanding uh, uh, special rights as a uh, as a gay individual, but he wanted to enjoy the respect that all other Singaporeans uh, enjoy. And you know, reading that, I think as a um, as an Indian Singaporean or a Malay Singaporean or a quote unquote other Singaporean, <laughs> right? The CMIO uh, uh, framework. Uh, you you wonder where was this respect this whole time? So I think I think yeah. what that points to is is a kind of um, maybe a, a kind of myopia times in in uh, in the um, more established uh, spaces in the LGBT community. So I, I, I you know I I I don't know if if uh, if that makes makes sense to you, Robin, or if that uh, relates to to um, to your observations and experiences as a researcher? It does, I mean, and it's interesting to me because, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, somebody, you know, at, at the time, at the time, well, at the time I was in Singapore, um, you know, I did, I did spend some time in the bars and, you know, I, I just, let me just, quick story, I'm not sure if, it, if it's really relevant or not, but, you know, I, I, I talk about this in one of the book chapters I've written. And, you know, I was, the back, I was the backstage one night and there were two, two men sitting next to me at the bar. And one of the guys was sort of chatting me up and I got up to go to the bathroom and I walked by and I overheard his friend saying, don't bother with him. He's only into black guys, right? And what he meant by black guys was Indian Singaporeans, right? And, and that really, and again, I wrote a whole chapter about this in, a, in, a, in an edited volume because I thought it was such an interesting comment, right? And I know, I know what they were thinking. I mean, they, you know, my, my best friend in Singapore and one of my very close friends now um, was, an, was an Indian Singaporean. And we went out to the bars a lot together and people assumed we were a couple and we weren't. 
Um, but that, but that idea of saying, you know, he's only into black guys, um, to me was a very, you know, sort of very racialized kind of comment, right? And at the time, I really wasn't, I really kind of <laughs> was into Indian guys. So it wasn't completely off base, but I think, you know, stating that sort of to his friend was disturbing in a way, right? Um, And, and again, this sort of there's a there's a there's a story that I read recently in the news about um, you know I think it was on Twitter about you know just just race and housing in Singapore. And again, I know that the, the focus here is LGBT, but this was a very interesting story where somebody shared um, text messages um, from a potential landlord, and you know when when this person gave their name, uh, the landlord said, oh we only rent to Chinese, right? Um, and again, I, I mean, I, I, I understand that, but I think at the same time, it sort of exposes that kind of racialized everyday life in Singapore. And the LGBT world is not immune to that at all. It's, no. I, I think it, it's in many ways, um, it's everywhere. Um, and again, I, I, I should point out, you know, that, that I can be very critical of Singapore, but, you know, it is also one of those places um, that I absolutely love, right? And that, you know, given the chance, I would move back to Singapore in a heartbeat, right? <laughs> given, given the chance of an, ac an academic job, um, I would move back in a heartbeat because, I mean, I, I love the people, I love the country. Um, and I know that I see Adi laughing, but, but I think, you know, but it, it is. It's, it's, it's one of those places I hold very dear um, in my heart though I criticize it quite openly um, as a non-Singaporean, um, yeah. perhaps. I, I think to, to quote a, uh, I can't remember who it was. So, so I think some, someone from, from the government, uh, you, you have to be a loving cr critic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, and again, I, I think there's a lot of issues in Singapore. And, and again, I have to acknowledge, you know, that as, as a white male foreigner, um, my experience was completely different um, that I'm sure is the daily lived reality of, of many Singaporeans, right? I think, I mean, I have to acknowledge that. Um, and it, you know, wouldn't, it wouldn't be fair not to, right? That, that I do acknowledge that. And I, you know, I really, I felt it a lot when I was in Singapore. Um, mm -hmm. I was taking a taxi home from backstage one night at about two in the morning. And the taxi driver was speaking in Mandarin to one of his friends. And he asked me where I was going. And I said, uh, Clemente Avenue, number two, block 429, or whatever it was. Anyway, block yeah, 429. And he, he giggled and he tells his friend in Mandarin, um, you know, this Angmo lives in public housing, basically, um, making fun of the fact that I was living in an HDB flat. Um, and I asked him later, he said, well, I thought that all of you foreigners lived in private condominiums. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, just to, Yeah, just you, you should have story. been in Holland Village instead. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people always said, you live in Clemente? In HDB? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope that that answers uh, Sinu's uh, question. Um, if, uh, Sinu, if you want, if you want to follow up, please feel free to to do so. I, I'm going to uh, um, unmute Jason. So, Jason, you you'll be able to ask your question now. Thank you, Adi. Um, is it coming through all right? It's coming yes. through. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yes, I I I want to. Um, I would repeat Sinu's um, thanks for a, a very interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering about, uh, my question is comparable, although it's possibly from another point of view, and it has to do with discourses of Occidentalism. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm using that term cautiously because I'm not um, an expert in that field. My, my focus is quite firmly on um, Europe. But, I'm wondering about the account of the West and the Western um, in as as a kind of a foil to Singapore, and I'm wondering how stably you stage that foil 
in the book. I, I, I mean, obviously, I'm talking without knowledge because I haven't read it. But uh, when you were talking about the coming out experience, for instance, it sounded like a, it sounded like, I'm sorry, but more of a stereotype than a reality. And it sounded like a particular kind of white, um, not just middle class, but prosperous experience. I mean, I am personally a um, upper middle class wasp. Um, I might not sound like it, but I grew up in, in Ohio. And um, it sounded as though the kind of experience that was described was bounded by both culture and wealth and also by generation. And I, 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 again, I, I do want to speak very cautiously, but I have to admit, I was a little bit worried about certain kinds of um, counter-transference if you'll forgive me that term, coming into some of this analysis. And I'm wondering, just to, to give another example, when you were talking about your awful experiences belonging to that particular generation of the, those who were affected by AIDS, um, as a child of the 90s, I remember very clearly how different it was coming immediately after that generation, and also how very different experiences were for those who were coming of age only four or five years after me. So things were changing very quickly. That is a traumatic experience, and it's something that needs to be taken account of. And, in, and, and talking about Salt Lake City, the environment of Salt Lake City versus the um, Wasp East, Oh my God. Um, my father's p folks were of Northern Irish stock and they were mainline Protestants from Nebraska. I will leave you to imagine what such people say about Mormons. So uh, all, all of this is going towards a, a problematic that I see about the presentation even of white America as monolithic, let alone Oh. The white world, let alone the West, as monolithic because non-lithic because obviously the West is not white. So it seems as though there are a lot of questions of referential intersectionality that I'd like to hear you at, at least elaborate on, if you could. And I apologize for giving you kind of a hydra of a question, but uh, it's. It, it's something it, it's something that seemed to be begging to be talked about, given that Singapore and the USA, in terms of their ethnic and class makeup, actually have a lot of basis of comparison, precisely because of their diversity. And again, I work on Europe, so I know the USA is not the West. Okay, yeah. No, and, and thank you, Jason, for that question. Um, it is a many-headed hydra, but, you know, I, I think... What I hear you asking about is, you know, why I'm comparing Singapore to the West or why I'm comparing Singapore to America. And the reason that I do that is because, again, my experience in Singapore was that that's what people in Singapore were doing, right? That, and again, I'm not sure that I, I write about it in this book, but it's this, it was always striking to me where people in Singapore would say, um, they have gay marriage in the Netherlands, we should have gay marriage, right? They, had, they have gay marriage in Massachusetts, we should have gay marriage. And it was this kind of sort of inexplicable comparison that people used, right? They, they somehow were equating Western politics with Singaporean politics or Western ideals with Singaporean ideals, right? That somehow because we had legalized gay marriage in the US, it should, it should also be legalized in Singapore. Um, and I think that to me was the, was the problem. I, I, use, I use the West as a foil to Singapore because that was how it was framed when I was in Singapore, right? That it was, you know, if only we could be like America, right? Or people would say to me, you're so lucky to live in America, right? And, I, and again, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, 
you know, the diversity of America because, you know, I'm, I'm living right now. Um, I was born and raised in rural Idaho and I'm living right now in semi-rural Indiana, uh, not too far from Ohio. And, you know, my, my, my city that I live in now is like, is 90% white. Um, very different um, from my city in Idaho, which was 96% white. And, and so I think, I think that, yeah, America is very diverse. Um, experiences are very diverse. Um, and so, yeah, if I have talked about um, the United States or, the, or, or Europe as a foil to Singapore, um, it's only because, like I said, that's because two things, I'm speaking sort of in generalities, right? Um, in, in terms of time, but also because that's how Singaporeans framed things, right? That because the West has it, we should have it too. Does that, does that make sense? Well, it, it makes sense to me. And, and I, I think uh, there are two contextual elements that, that uh, would help make sense of that um, e even more. One is that uh, cultural diversity elsewhere often gets reduced into a kind of simple category in other in in you know where where you are. So you know we think about it in terms of cuisine. It's very easy to see, right? Uh, Indian food in the U.S. and in the U.K. is not uh, at all Indian food in Kerala or or Singapore. And the, the special category of Western food in uh, in in Singapore at hawker centers, right? Um, has no equivalent um, almost anywhere in the world. It's a very special kind of category. So, but um, we, we perceive, I think, other cultures as um, um, often without uh, intentionally doing so uh, through the prism of our own uh, wants and desires and our own rootedness in, in the place that, that, uh, that we're at. Um, and with America, it... Um, you know, I, 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 I wonder how this, this is changing for, for uh, uh, the, uh, the Zoomer generation now uh, growing up with, uh, with the, this image of, of, a, um, uh, of a Trump America far away that's, uh, that's quite insane. Um, but I think the impact of, of American popular culture in, uh, in Singapore is, is, is undeniable from uh, from TV shows in, in the 70s and 80s all the way uh, to, to the present day. Um, it's, I, I think that's the America that, um, that, that, um, that the people, the people see and they, they take that and fit that into, into uh, their particular uh, circumstances. So they're not thinking about the difference between Salt Lake City or, uh, you know, where you are, Muncie, Indiana and, uh, and New York City. They, you know, they have this kind of globalized image of, um, of, um, of America, this commercialized image of, uh, of America, you know, America TM, so to speak. Uh, the, the other thing is um, that our uh, uh, politicians have uh, often compared Singapore to, uh, to, to Western, Western countries. Um, our leaders, uh, it's, it's actually quite complex because on, on the one hand, you have uh, people like Go Chok Tong talking about it, uh, about uh, a Swiss standard of living, so comparing us to, uh, to Switzerland. On right. the other hand, you have uh, that generation of the PAP and this current generation of the PAP uh, inventing this notion of Asian value. So it's a kind of balance that, um, that, that takes place in, uh, in Singaporean uh, politics and establishment politics between aspiring to, um, to the um, uh, to elements uh, of, uh, of the West, especially in, in, in terms of, um, of uh, wealth and, and uh, um, uh, you know, I hesitate, hesitate to say economic model as well, because, uh, you know, Singapore's, uh, Singapore's version of capitalism is, uh, is, is quite, is quite distinct, right? The state is a major player in uh, in, in Singaporean capitalism, but there is an aspiration um, to certain aspects of the West, while retaining some kind of um, you know um, no no less um, no less invented Asianness, right? So you have an interplay between two different kind of two different uh, imaginaries in Singapore. So that lends itself very well. 
for um, uh, a LGBT Singaporean to, to, to then make demands and say, well, um, uh, these countries that, uh, that our politicians compare us to, to they have uh, these rights, why, why don't we? Because it has a concrete impact on the lives of LGBT people in terms of housing in Singapore, where uh, most housing, like 90% of housing is public housing. And in order to apply for public housing, you actually, it's tied to, uh, <laughs> it's tied to uh, your, your marital status. So um, you essentially have to be married uh, or have the intention to be married to, uh, to, to get subsidized public housing. And uh, what happens if you're, if you're gay and you can't get married when, uh, when actually, uh, so to speak, your, uh, by extension, your existence is criminalized. So we're very far away from, from talking about marriage. You know, what do you do? You, you, um, you, you're entirely locked out of, uh, of the, uh, the public housing market. So it has very real um, uh, impact. So, you know, I wouldn't say that, that Singapore is a kind of... Um, I, I would say that this is a, if this is also a form of making do, a form of um, of um, um, reacting to the constraints that uh, that are placed upon you and trying to figure out what is the best way to make your argument, and that that changes from time to time. Yes, and I just want to I, I just want to add too, you know, in terms of in term, and again, I know that Singaporeans know this, but you know, you know, Singapore is not monolithic either in terms of in terms of population, and I think. You know, one of the one of the views um, that I often hear here here in America is, you know, how wealthy Singapore is, and you know the the, the standard of living in Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. But I think I think you know it 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 should be pointed out that there are you know a lot of Singaporeans that are not um, living wonderful, successful lives, right? Um, that there are Singaporeans that um, you know, for a variety of reasons, are you know marginalized? Whether it's their sexuality, or, you know, sexuality and gender, um, their 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 race, their ethnicity, um, they are not part of that sort of Singaporean miracle, right? Yeah. That they are still sort of those that are left behind. Um, and I think it was uh, Martin Martin C. who did the videos that were banned by the government. Um, he made a bunch of videos that, that looked at sort of the other side of Singapore, right? That it's not just those, those wealthy Singaporeans that live and shop on Orchard Road, right? It, that there are many, many lower middle class Singaporeans yeah. um, that, are, that struggle, right? Just like any place else in the world. Um, so yeah. Yeah. does that answer your question, Jason, at all? Uh, I, I've taken Jason off, but um, oh. just in the interest of time so that we can go to, oh. to another question, comment, but then Absolutely. we can go back to Jason if, uh, if, if he has okay. uh, something to, to, to add to that. Sure. Um, so, so if you want to add to that again, just uh, uh, yeah, let, let us know. Um, so we have a comment from a anonymous attendee. Um, thank you, Adi and Rob, for mentioning Tongji. Tongji can be understood in many ways, such as a type of literature, uh, in particular in uh, in Taiwan, um, an identity, uh, Tongji identity, etc. And uh, this this uh, person says, as a Chinese gay Muslim. I would say Tongji is not only about love, affect, togetherness, etc. It could be an indication of stigmatization, especially in mainland China and or the uh, Sinophone world at large. Thank you. Thank you. No, absolutely. I thank you for the clarification. Um, and again, I was just I was just sort of speaking in the interest of time. I, I have written. I think there's you know quite a, not quite a bit, but you know maybe a half a chapter about Tongja in here. Um, and it does, it does go way beyond, you know, things like love and affect. Um, and it, and it can, um, as you, as you rightly point out, um, be seen as a mode of stigmatization or a way of, you know, a way of stigmatizing uh, people. So thank you for that clarification. 
Um, all right, J Jason has another uh, an, another point to make, so I'm, I'm going to invite him again in a moment. Um, and before I do that, just just to remind everyone that um, you can raise your hand or write us a message uh, directly, ask a question to the Q and A uh, function. Um, we are coming towards the end, but there is still time for a couple more questions. So let's go back to um, to to Jason. Sorry, thank you, Adi. Thank th thank you both very much. It, well, it's a it's a measure of the it's a measure of the work that we are already developing such a such a rich conversation. But um, my main concern was really more about um, a, a risk of slippage of a methodological slippage in constructing the basis of comparison within um, well the Singaporean imaginary of what America might be. Um, there seems to be a process whereby um, white consumerist America becomes America, becomes the West. And that in the creation of what is called a globalized model of the West, there is actually really a successful process of stereotyped parochialism produced by certain kinds of mostly white American mercantilist interests in creating an image of America and a discourse of America that has no connection to material reality, although it is certainly a political reality. And I would, I would propose that talking about America as it is and comparing America as it is, as opposed to how it is seen to be even in the studied target population's mind, might possibly be more fruitful as a method of analysis. I do realize that America as it exists in the Singaporean mind might be very close to America as it exists in the comfortable white wasp mind, but that is not what America actually is. And the analytic possibilities that can be derived from attacking that slippage, both in constructing the basis of comparison, which is America, and in analyzing the subject, which is Singapore, are really valuable and should, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering how much, uh, I'm just wondering how cautiously um, this conversation is constructing um, its various subjects because it is not only Singapore that can be colonized. America itself is an inherently colonial, colonialized construct, and it is very good at colonizing itself. And I'm nervous that that self-colonization process has already taken place before this analysis begins. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I mean, and again, I hear what you're saying, and I, I, I agree. I mean, I think, and I think, but I, I don't, I, I think that it would, it would be fruitful to analyze what's happening in Singapore against the reality of what America is, right, rather than the ideal that occurs in many people's minds. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here, but I, I think, you know, the, I think a really good example of that is, is, you know, a very good friend of mine um, moved to the US in 1999 from India. And he had grown up in India and he learned English basically by watching um, the sitcom Friends. And although, you know, he's a, very intelligent human being. He had an idea in his young mind that America was like friends, right? Where it was just a group of people in New York and hung and hanging out in beautiful apartments and everyone had money and nobody had jobs really because they were so rich. And, and when he got here, the university he was attending um, had a volunteer trip to a homeless shelter where they fed, they fed the homeless. This was in Southern Alabama. They fed the homeless one Saturday afternoon. 
And my friend came home and he called me and he, he, he cried for almost 20 minutes. Sort of, you know, in, in, in this kind of grief about America not being what he thought it was, right? That he really, he really had this idea of what he thought America was going to be like and it wasn't. And I think that to me is, again, sort of an example of this, this globalized notion of what America is. Um, and the reality is much harsher. I mean, it's a much, it's a much different place, I think, than, than people realize. But I'm not sure how I would, I'm not sure how to do an analysis of sort of Singapore, events versus American reality versus American ideal. I can't, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I, 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 I can. I'm so sorry about that tech glitch. Oh, no. yes. thank, thank you. That, that's a, a, a very, a very thoughtful response. Um, I, I think we could, we could probably talk about this for ages, but it would be arrogant of me at the very least to do that without first reading your book. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that would be unfair of me. But thank thank you very much for the, for, you, for your um, for, for your engagement. And thank you for your question, Jason. I appreciate it. All right. Um, well, we, we can probably take one more or or even two more questions before we uh, we call it a day. Um, so does anyone else want to want to chime in? Uh, I see a hand somewhere. Oh. Uh, okay. Yes. Oh, send you again. Hi, if um, you all don't mind my asking another question. Um, I was just typing it just now, um, but um, if I could just follow up on the question just now on Tongzhi, for example, um, how much would you place Singapore in some kind of Sinophone context? Because I mean, there, there are people in Singapore who read Chinese, for example, who consume Chinese media, who are engaged with the debates in Hong Kong or Taiwan or mainland China, for example, but then there are also plenty of people who don't, for example. So it always strikes me that one has to like do this kind of like triangulation between different languages, different geopolitical contexts when talking about Singapore. So I was wondering if you all had any thoughts about this. Yeah, I, and again, I'm not sure if, I, if I'm hearing the question correctly, but, but no, I think, and again, I, I point out in the book that nobody, nobody really used the term Tongzhi directly, right, when, when speaking to me. Um, it was always, um, and if they did, it was always sort of in a, in a casual conversation with somebody who I would term an activist, right? And for the most part, those activists um, were Chinese, middle class, um, English speaking, uh, you know, uh, polyphones, right? But I think, but I think, Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Adi, do you understand, do you understand? Uh, well, maybe, maybe could, Sinyu could- uh, Sinyu, maybe you can be more, sorry, maybe you can sort of clarify. Sorry, I, I'll rephrase my question. Um, I guess part of, um, so I also work on Singapore. So part mm -hmm. of um, the question that a lot of people ask me is like, um, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, comparative framework do you situate Singapore in? Is it part of, say, Southeast Asia, for example? Oh. Uh, is it part of like some kind of like Sinophone world where you know you compare, you use concepts like Tongzhi, for example, and mm -hmm. bring it into conversation with Hong Kong and Taiwan and mainland China, or do you situate it in some other kind of post-colonial space? Um, that I don't know, like, for example, you can do comparisons with India, for example, with like the repeal of 377 in India, for example, and the non-repeal of it in Singapore, for right. example. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, wasn't it, wasn't it, wasn't it unrepealed in India as well? Or was it? Anyway. Um, no, so, I, I think I understand what you're saying now. No, and I, and I, I do, I do, I frame, I frame Singapore um, and I don't think I write about it in the book, 
but I, I've, in the past, I've framed Singapore as one of the four Chinas, right? I, I, it's the fourth China, right? So you have, you have mainland China, you have Taiwan, you have Hong Kong, and you have Singapore. Um, so I, I've often looked at and written about Singapore as the fourth China, because it is almost, um, in my mind, um, almost like a satellite of, like, you know, a satellite nation of China. Um, because there is so much emphasis on China, Chinese culture, um, you know, we had um, not directly related here, but we had, you know, we had the Speak Mandarin campaigns um, 20, 30 years ago. We had the Speak Mandarin campaigns where they were trying to sort of um, get everyone who spoke any of the Chinese dialects to all speak one dialect, which is Mandarin, which of course is sort of the, um, the way of speaking in mainland China, right, for the most part. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and that's how I frame it. The other, the other way that I sort of frame Singapore though, um, and I haven't written about this too much, but I frame it in, in some ways as a non-place. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the anthropologist, uh, he's uh, French, uh, Marc Auge, um, writes about this concept of non-places and, and so non-places, according to, um, to him, are places like shopping malls, bus stations, airports, um, places where, sort of those places that are in between, right? Um, and again, I'm not sure if that's really a fair characterization of Singapore, but I think that's one way to sort of think about it. Um, but I think this idea of, you know, I, I do think that in, in many respects, I mean, I think, you know, isn't, I, I believe that, you know, Singapore is what, 74% uh, ethnic Chinese. And so I think this idea of a Sinophone nation is not completely off, you know, off track. And, and if I could is, add, it, it's not just that, that Singapore is 74% um, is uh, ethnically Chinese, but that the, the government has, uh, through policy, sought to maintain that particular ratio of, uh, of Chinese right. Malay Indian. Lee Kuan Yew in the past uh, famously said that if uh, we were a Malay nation or an Indian nation, we wouldn't have succeeded. Uh, we need that to be 75% Chinese. So through policy, this has been, uh, has been maintained in terms of immigration quotas. So um, in, in that sense, um, you know, what you're saying, Rob, um, I, I think uh, uh, makes, well, it makes sense. Uh, what, what do you think, Sinyu? Yeah, I definitely agree. There, there is a lot of structural um, racial dynamics in Singapore that is also um, something that's um, enacted by the state, for example, in terms of policy. I also was just thinking about like, even like in terms of Chinese as a category, for example, because I mean, oh. a lot of the elite are ethnically Chinese, for example, but then they may not be good at, they may not be proficient at like written Chinese or even like speaking Chinese, for example. I mean, it's not like there's a huge Chinese language literary scene in Singapore. I mean, the only literary magazine in Chinese had to move to Malaysia because there wasn't really a readership in Singapore. So right. I think it's, it's, I mean, there is a, a lot of, um, I mean, like structural dynamics of maintaining Chinese supremacy on the one hand. And then also like just some kind of like transculturation, I would e even say of like a very English speaking elite that may not, you know, identify with terms like Tongzhi when you know, oh, like right. they may not speak that much Chinese. They may not read that much Chinese, but they may be more in tune with um, debates happening in the U.S. And also there are like also a lot of cultural producers, um, like a, a lot of say Malay cultural producers who situate queerness in Singapore as part of a Malay world, for example. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the last one, I guess, sorry, I was just gonna say that last point I think ties in nicely with, uh, with, with the formation of Bisu. Uh, recently, the the Malay group that I that I mentioned that draws on a uh, a pre-colonial uh, Bugis culture. Mm -hmm. So sorry, Rob, you you were gonna. Uh... Yeah, and I was just gonna add too. I mean, I think I think, and again, I, I I'm not. I have a anyway. I'm not really proficient in in terms of religion in Singapore, but I do but I do notice that many of uh, the leaders of Singapore are Christian, and 
I think that's interesting. I think I think that is in some ways, you know, like a de um, you know, where they adopt this foreign religion. Um, don't want up in a can of worms here, but I just think I, I just think it's important to sort of point out that there is this kind of very yeah, I don't know. Well, a particular kind of Christianity, right? It, it's a, oh. a, a evangelical, um, you know, going back to like uh, to to uh, the idea of America. You know, that that's a different idea of America that that's uh, that's implanted itself within uh, certain aspects of uh, of middle class, upper middle class, English speaking Chinese Singaporeans. Um, and I mean, recently, I, I, I don't know if people uh, noticed this, but recently uh, you had a church that made a video about uh, uh, about uh, um, Pink Dot and, L and the LGBT community as being, um, you know, I, I can't remember, it was, it was really insane, which is why I'm, I'm finding it hard to find the words, but it was something like, uh, they were saying that uh, that uh, that this movement is one of the ways that that uh, Satan manifests uh, himself in the physical uh, plane in Singapore. So it's kind of really kind of like um, insane kind of um, um, I don't even know what the term is to to, to describe it, but it's it's taking root uh, among um, certain. Uh, upper middle class, middle class Chinese communities, uh, Chinese Christian communities in in Singapore. But it's interesting, I think, uh, to to note that we don't in Singapore we don't consider that as a form of um, of um, as a importation of American culture, e even though it clearly is. Uh, what what the establishment considers to be an importation of American culture tends to be things like. Um, uh, discourses on race, uh, discourses on on equality, uh, in particular to to, uh, to LGBT and, and individuals. So it's interesting to think of what gets uh, classified as a Western import and what doesn't, when clearly um, this brand of evangelical Christianity is a is a Western import. I mean, I would go so far to to uh, to argue that it's uh, it's a uh, indicator of um, of a kind of uh, re-colonial uh, uh, ideology. No, abs absolutely, and I and I should I should add, you know, that that there were many times in Singapore, um, you know, when I was in when I was in public places or you know on the train going into the city, where people would approach me, and they would they would, you know, invite me to church or they would, they would ask me which church I went to. Um, this kind of assumption that, you know, sort of once they found out, um, once they found out that I was American, they assumed that I was Christian, right? And of course, I mean, I'm Jewish. So, but it's, I think, I think it's that sort of equating being American with being Christian is, is something else too that I think is interesting. Right, that there's this built-in assumption. I had the exact same thing happen to me in India constantly, where people would say, "I'm Christian too," you know. <laughs> I'd be like, "Why do you think I'm Christian?" Right? Um, but it's that it's that kind of idea I think of equating Christianity with this idea of the West. And I think I hate. <laughs> I don't want to uh, get Jason going again, but no. But I really appreciate I really appreciate the question. All right. Um, Sinu, did that did that um, respond to, to to your question? Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot to both of you. Thank you, Sinu. All right. Thank you. Um, if if we don't have um, any final questions, any any burning uh, comments or critiques, um, I'll, I'll wait two seconds uh, to see if anyone wants to ask a final question. No. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for, for attending, for asking questions, for participating. Uh, you all have received the, uh, the special code if you want to, to get the 40% discount um, of the book. If, um, if, if you run into any, any issues, you feel free to write to, to either one of us and we can try to help um, uh, sort things out. Um, 
and uh, we hope to see you soon again at uh, at other JMRN uh, events. Um, if you're on the list, so if you will regularly get uh, updates. If not, if you go to the website, you will uh, you will be able to register um, on on the list, or you can email email me as well. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, and uh, thanks, Rob, for the uh, for the great discussion and uh, and for writing such a thought provoking book. Well, thank you, Adi, and I appreciate everybody who attended today. Um, thank you all for the thought provoking questions. Um, and I really I really appreciate the chance to talk about my work. Um, it's always nice to uh, have a, have a engaged audience. So thank you very much.